Hey folks, George here again to talk about interesting issues in the philosophy of law. Uh, we're following up. This is a continuation of the previous uh, discussion about what is law, especially within the context or, and through the perspective, through the prism of the Nuremberg trials following World War II in 1945. Let's uh, just rehash some of those ideas really quick of uh, following World War II, the Allied powers, instead of simply executing all of the Nazi uh, leaders, what they did was put them on trial and charge them with three main crimes. The first being crimes against peace, the second being uh, cr uh, war crimes, and then finally crimes against humanity. The reason that David Adams starts with this interesting uh, case study of the Nuremberg trials is because it really makes us look at this question of what is law? What is the nature of law? Uh, because none of these three crimes were on the books, so to speak. Uh, there was no international law before 1945. Uh, well, let me back off on that a little bit. Clearly there were uh, international treaties and things, but the question is when you violate an international treaty, even uh, before 1945, what sort of trial was there? How did you violate the law? Either a country goes to war with you or they uh, just let it go, right? Uh, there aren't a uh, rule of law. Uh, the rule of law isn't implemented in order to put violators of some international law on trial or the violators of some international treaty on trial. And yet this is the first time this happens in uh, human history, really, these Nuremberg trials in 1945. I said last time also that these trials were followed up in Tokyo, uh, charging and uh, putting on trial many of the Japanese uh, leaders for, uh, for a Tokyo tribunal. That trial, because Nuremberg set the precedent, that trial doesn't have precedent necessarily as its um, primary problem, but there were many other interesting philosophical problems that emerged through the Tokyo trials, if you uh, do some research there. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to discuss those problems here, but it is an interesting case, especially for those of us who really like uh, Japanese history, and especially those of us who like the uh, conflicts that happen when there are uh, cultural conflicts, right? Uh, East versus West, and things like this. So last time I talked about Robert Jackson's ideas uh, when he's presenting at the opening of the Nuremberg trials and trying to defend that these trials at Nuremberg, this tribunal, is following the rule of law and is a great example of the rule of law. Well, now we're going to hear the other side of that uh, debate by Charles Wazanski. And Wazanski is going to argue that these Nuremberg trials in 1945 are not legal. As a matter of fact, he even argues so far as to say that they are, they violate the very understanding of rule of law. They are very much a, a paradigmatic of injustice and why uh, we shouldn't look at these as uh, legal trials in terms of law, right? That said, that said, before, before uh, we get into uh, his arguments. Charles Wazanski is intelligent and he recognizes what the Nazi forces did during World War II and with that in mind he never says wait a second we should just set these people free. He never suggests that. He also acknowledges these are terrible terrible people and they shall be punished. They should be punished, right? However his whole point is we should punish them in the way that uh, victors punish uh, the losers of wars. That is, we should just hang them and not put on this farce of a tribunal or a war uh, crimes trial uh, because this violates the very essence of, war of uh, rule of law. This violates the very essence of rule of law. Uh, that said, uh, why does it violate the very essence of the rule of law? And even Robert Jackson acknowledges that uh, for the three main charges, um, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Even Robert Jackson acknowledged that these were not laws that were on the books. There was no international law 
for against war crimes. There was no international law. There is no international law in 1945 uh, against crimes against humanity. There was no international law about crimes against peace, right? Now, he does acknowledge that Robert Jackson tried to justify these, and so he says, wait a second, let's look at some of these um, crimes that were actually on the books in terms of international treaties. He looks at the Hague Convention of 1907, and he says, yes, let's look at what the Hague Convention uh, stipulated. Um, there were many crimes stipulated in this international treaty, such as torturing prisoners. That is a crime. Um, but there weren't, any, there weren't any such war crimes. Now, if you want to put the Nazis on trial for torturing prisoners, that's one thing. But call it what it is. Don't call it war crimes. And so with that in mind, he, uh, Wisansky suggests that these very Nuremberg tribunals uh, are very much fly in the face of rule of law. They are not rule of law, and we shouldn't uh, consider them as such. He talks, first of all, about, uh, and this is the most important part, I, at least from my perspective, uh, for uh, Wisansky's argument, and that is, he says there cannot be, the very essence of rule of law is that there cannot be ex post facto laws. There can't be laws that are uh, charged after the fact. And that's exactly what these laws, these Nuremberg uh, tribunals are charging the Nazi prisoners with. Laws that were only written down after the fact, after the crime was committed. And for that reason, that is primarily the strongest uh, case that Wisansky has against the very essence of these being legal trials. There is a very important principle, according to Wisansky, and not just according to Wisansky, but this is a very deep, uh, within the essence of a rule of law, that there can be no crime and no penalty without a law. In the Latin, it's nullum crimen et nulla poena sine lege. There is no crime and no penalty without law. And that is ultimately what we say is this is an ex post facto law that violates the very essence of rule of law. Retroactive laws are evil, Wisansky says. If you violate this principle of saying there is no crime and no penalty without a prior written law, if you violate that principle, you violate the very essence of rule of law because this makes law arbitrary. That's exactly what rule of law is supposed to be about. What is law? Law is supposed to be such that there aren't just arbitrary rules thrown at people. Right now I'm wearing a green sweater, right? If one of you is in power and says, wait a second, we shall punish you for wearing that green sweater because I don't like George, right? And, well, there is no law against wearing green sweaters. Well, now there is. And if a ruler did that, that isn't rule of law anymore. That's completely arbitrary. That's rule of man. That's exactly what rule of law is supposed to stop. And that's the strength and the weight of Wisansky's argument here. If we just pick any arbitrary ex post facto law to uh, charge any criminal with, then we're no longer doing rule of law. We're going back to uh, dictators, basically, or monarchs, absolute monarchs, who just write laws whenever they want to and punish whomever they want to. It makes law completely arbitrary. And that's exactly what rule of law is supposed to stop, the arbitrariness of some absolute ruler. Now, Wisansky has to respond to Jackson who suggests, well, these aren't exactly uh, ex post facto laws. After all, there is the Bryant Kellogg Act, right, which says that there's a crime against uh, a war, and that war is renounced, right? Here's Wisansky's response to that. Fine. However, that pact, that treaty, is supposed to be geared towards governments, towards the whole country, not individuals. And that's why this is inapplicable. 
This is why we can't apply that Kellog uh, Brian's Kellogg Act towards individual Nazis. If anything, they should have applied it to the whole German nation and punished the German nation because it's a country that signed that sort of treaty, not, not individual Nazis. And so we can't punish individual Nazis for violating an international treaty. Now, uh, this is just one of my philosophical concerns. I'm going to take a little bit of a, a detour for just a moment, if you'll forgive me, please. Um, yeah, I, I always like to question this very quest, this very idea. What does it mean to apply a law against the state instead of an individual? Right? What is this thing called the state? Um, and why can't you apply it to an individual? Uh, that, to me, is odd. Right? So if a leader of some nation does some terrible thing, we should punish the nation but not the individual leader. Um, the international community should punish the nation but not the, uh, the individual leader. That seems interesting to me. That seems interesting and it stimulates a little bit of uh, thinking on my part. I don't want to get too much into that right now though. Now let's come back to uh, Wisansky and his evaluation of the Nuremberg trials. Another big problem that he has with this is uh, Jackson's, uh, he thinks Jackson is really uh, being fishy here, or at least he's not being completely honest. If we recall, Robert Jackson suggested, oh, these are going to be dispassionate trials. The defendants are going to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. They're going to be able to defend themselves. We will uh, give them a fair trial. Wisansky says, rubbish. There's no way that this is a neutral trial. Everybody knows that these defendants are going to be found guilty even before they started the trial. So Wisansky is a little bit uh, cynical or looks with a cynical eye towards Jackson's claims to being uh, neutral and dispassionate and innocent until proven guilty. Wisansky says, oh, that's a lie. Come on, don't, don't lie to people, please. Furthermore, Wisansky says the Nazis weren't the only ones who violated the international treaties in World War II. After all, one of the allied, uh, victorious allied powers, Russia, at the end of World War II, violated their peace treaty with Japan and broke that treaty and invaded Japan at the end of World War II after uh, the first atomic bomb, right? Uh, that's why are the Russians being brought up on trial, right? And so Wisansky looks with a more cynical eye and says, yeah, come on, you guys are lying to us. Why aren't we, if, if we really cared about rule of law, why aren't we putting everybody on trial here, uh, including the Russians? And, you know, from a 21st century perspective, we might even say, why not uh, put other forces on trial after all? Or is using nuclear weapons, was dropping the atomic bomb on a, a mass of civilians? In Japan to end World War II, was that a war crime? I don't know. Why isn't that being brought to trial? Right? Wisansky doesn't bring up that, that last example, but it is something that makes us think and go, oh, wait a second, isn't this all a show? Wisansky looks at one of the laws, crimes against peace. If we recall, crimes against peace was namely planning, preparing, initiating, or waging war of aggression or war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances, or participation in a common plan or conspiracy. Wisansky says, wait a second, what is this thing called conspiracy? Of course, all people who do the murders are, of course, guilty of murders. But who are the conspirators in this case? Right? Is every Nazi, is every member of the Nazi party, which is whole swaths of Germany, by the way, were they all conspirators? After all, they were all Nazis, right? Did they conspire in the same way as everybody else? Uh, Wisansky is uh, uh, troubled by the nebulous notion of conspiracy and who in a war conspires. Does every citizen of a nation, after all, aren't they co-conspirators in a certain way? Um, that seems odd. That seems odd to Wisansky. Now, of course, Wisansky is going to acknowledge that defendants who are able to stand up and defend themselves and present their own arguments, that is a good thing. And Wisansky acknowledges that. But, again, 
let's not fool ourselves. Nobody is presuming that they are innocent until proven guilty. Everybody knows that they will be proven guilty at the end. This isn't really about law. Rather, this is about judgment. And so uh, the allied powers are putting on a show that is really political judgment being disguised as a legal trial. And this is propaganda. Doesn't that make this whole thing tro uh, propaganda? Doesn't this whole thing actually debase the notion of justice and rule of law? That's why Wisansky is uh, against the notion of these Nuremberg tribunals or these Nuremberg trials. Right? After all, law should be about restraining power. But what is this really? This is an example of the Allied powers exercising their muscles and exercising their power and saying, look at us, we're going to put on a show for you while, right before we execute you the way that everybody knew we were going to execute you anyway. That seems rather uh, odd. And this, of course, is, goes back to his central uh, idea that law is about, uh, uh, rather, a central idea of law is that there shall not be ex post facto laws. That's about restraining power, right? And so doesn't this show that so many people today, as David Adams, the uh, compiler and editor of the text, and the writer of the introductions, suggests that many uh, dictators, even in the 21st century, have said, we don't recognize international law. This is just Western imperialism masquerading as law. Right. So many of Wisansky's fears have uh, 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 been manifest in certain people's arguments who will work in defiance of this thing called international law. What shall be done? Well, Wisansky recognizes that they shall be punished. These Nazis shall be punished, but they should be punished in, uh, in, with the flavor of an executive order, not through this procedure of uh, math and masquerading as rule of law, right? And that's going to be uh, Wisansky's main point, that this whole thing really debases rule of law after all. What do you all think? Were these Nuremberg trials legal? Do they speak to law and justice? How might we respond to some of these international uh, figures today who reject international law when they're brought up on charges? This is all very interesting. Is it merely Western imperialism or is it merely victor's justice masquerading as rule of law? I think that Wisansky and Robert Jackson have given us a lot to chew on, a lot to think about, and a lot to consider. Uh, this will, uh, these sorts of questions will be asked in the future because it does get to this core idea about what is law? What is the nature of law? Can there be a such thing as international law? And by the way, what does this mean if there is a law that some figure didn't agree to? Can there be laws that violate fundamental principles such as uh, no ex post facto laws? Robert Jackson says, yes, we are talking about laws. Wisansky says, no, we need these procedures in place and we need to maintain the procedures to call it rule of law. What do you all think? I think it's quite a complicated uh, issue to really wrestle with, isn't it? Uh, next time we will talk about another debate uh, between some folks who will carry on these core ideas and these core uh, issues, these core issues, any further. Until then, see you next time. Bye-bye.